Um, we've heard a lot the last day and a half about uh, the opportunities that are there for Australian agriculture and, and certainly the main drivers are associated with increasing global demand for, for food and fibre. And we've heard a lot about the uh, uh, population increase which based on the information that I have is pretty much locked in that we're going to have between 9 and 10 million people uh, on the globe by, uh, by 2050. And, and importantly, um, as, uh, as we heard yesterday from Steve Hatfield Dodds, uh, the real opportunity there is not, not the actual quantum of people, it's going to be the standard of living that those people are able to, uh, to adopt. And, and I think a very telling statistic yesterday uh, was the fact that by, I think, OECD standards, we have about one billion people in the wealthy category uh, in the world today. But by 2050, we're going to have uh, around four billion people in that category. Now that's, that's pretty, uh, pretty uh, mind-blowing stuff when you think about the spending power that those, uh, those people are going to, uh, to have. Now of course most of that growth uh, population-wise and wealth-wise is going to be in Asia and Australia is very well positioned geographically to take uh, advantage from that. As well, a lot of our industries, uh, and uh, I should have said industries instead of sectors up there, uh, have focused a lot on, on research and development, adoption of technology in recent years, and, and have certainly increased their productivity and their production to keep pace with, uh, with the opportunity. Um, it's pretty interesting again from yesterday that we are keeping pace with uh, developing economies in regard to productivity, but that's not necessarily the case with developing uh, economies. Now there's no guarantee that Australian farmers are going to benefit from these opportunities uh, going forward and competition from other agricultural producers is increasing every single year. South American producers are getting their act together, Eastern European uh, producers are definitely getting their act together and, uh, and Frank and I had a discussion about this over lunch but I think the jury's still out on whether the uh, initiative, initiatives like the Belts and Roads initiative in, in China are going to be positive for us, neutral for us, or in fact negative for uh, us going forward. But there's no doubt uh, that, that the markets that we currently have uh, are eyed off or are being eyed off by other producers and there's no guarantee that we're going to continue to have them. The other issue that we face in this country is that productivity uh, in some industries has, uh, has flattened. Uh, and the rate of uh, productivity growth, has, in fact, has even gone back in some specific cases. And, uh, and that really is an issue for us. Um, again, from yesterday, uh, uh, our uh, export production is likely to flatline over the next few years. So that actually doesn't give us a, a great deal of opportunity to get too excited about too many new markets. Uh, if, we, uh, if we haven't got the productive capacity to, uh, to provide what those markets want. So what that means in essence is that we've got to get smarter. We've got to focus on, on niche market opportunities and, uh, and, and in my view, higher value market opportunities. So where, what role does government have to, uh, to play in all this? Uh, I think we have a history in this country of, of governments at all levels um, who have often tried to effectively pick winners by supporting specific industries, sub supporting geographic, specific geographic areas, and even with the best of intentions, that has not necessarily been successful. We've seen governments invest and be involved in statutory marketing boards, uh, commodity handling systems, building cotton gins in places they shouldn't have built, or helping industry build cotton gins in places they shouldn't have been built. Uh, at a macro level, we've seen ongoing support for the vehicle manufacturing uh, industry, which, which at the end of the day, none of those things have been very sustainable. So what do we need to compete? And one of the key things that we need uh, is efficient infrastructure uh, to enable us to be competitive uh, in those developing markets that we are here to concentrate on. The other important point is that our focus on research and development, if anything, has to increase. Technology, uh, whether it be productive technology, competitive infrastructure technology, are all absolutely vital. And, uh, and it's vital not only from 
uh, a government perception point of view, but it's also very vital for, from an industry confidence point of view, so that you know, in, private invest in private investment can move into specific areas uh, where government doesn't need to uh, or shouldn't be treading. So, um, some of these... Uh, uh, some of these areas, I think, are, are well enunciated in the Australian Infrastructure Plan that Infrastructure Australia put together and released in, in early 2016. And, and I think at a, at, a, at a macro level, Recommendation 4.1 really hits the nail on the head and summarises it well. And it says that state and, gov and territory governments should deliver long-term regional infrastructure plans. And I think plans, or well, two key words, long long-term and, uh, and plans uh, in, that, uh, in that particular statement. We need to plan our infrastructure spend, uh, not, not uh, get carried away by short-term opportunism, which is always tempting for, for governments. And those plans need to do a number of things, uh, and I'm not going to go through them in detail, but certainly uh, identify where the gaps are in infrastructure networks, um, coordinate investments uh, in specific areas, provide transparency for the private sector to give them confidence, as I said earlier, uh, to invest alongside government or individually. And, uh, and finally, ease pressure on our largest cities. Now, David Littleproud yesterday in his presentation talked uh, a little bit about decentralisation. And uh, de decentralisation is, a, is a, an old concept. It's been around for, for a long time. But when you look at the growth that we're going to experience in our key major cities, um, over the next 30, 40 years, um, we do need to revisit, at least relook at, the opportunities around decentralisation. Otherwise, uh, the population drift from our rural areas is only going to uh, continue to increase. Um, from a regional perspective, uh, recommendation 4.2 in the plan uh, talks about focusing infrastructure spend in many cases on those key regional towns and, and cities so that we in fact have the opportunity to develop hubs uh, with a, a key regional centre at the centre of those hubs or in those hubs uh, that can really provide all the services that, that uh, uh, people can get in the, uh, in the major cities. So uh, Infrastructure Australia recognised the importance of that and that recommendation uh, was, uh, was included in, uh, in the plan. Very, uh, very briefly, I just want to touch on, on some of the things that, that are happening at a macro level uh, and have been done by government uh, now or about to be done by government, which I, I think are uh, certainly uh, picking up on these themes that we uh, enunciated in that report. Firstly, uh, the National Freight and Supply Chain Initiative um, is, uh, is being developed. Uh, there's uh, plans for uh, a road reform study uh, that the uh, Commonwealth Government is, uh, is going to do at uh, some point in the, in the future. And even uh, the Regional Investment Corporation that Minister Littleproud mentioned yesterday uh, is, uh, uh, is quite an important opportunity to encourage uh, the, the growth of our regional communities and important our agricultural communities. <coughs> so at a more micro level, what are the specific areas of, uh, of focus in regard to uh, infrastructure spend by governments um, and, uh, and bearing in mind that I, I said a few moments ago that, that uh, governments have a, uh, a role of uh, facilitation rather than, uh, uh, rather than getting involved in specific areas. Very well respected agribusiness uh, person that I've known for many years, person who's had a lot of experience in, uh, in the north uh, and, uh, and many areas of agriculture has said on a number of occasions, give us all weather roads, reliable phone service, high speed internet access, and we'll be able to develop the north. And I think that applies just as much to many parts of Australia uh, that still don't have um, reliable internet access, still don't have all weather road access. Because without those basic things, it's very, very difficult for us to encourage investment in Australian agriculture. Whether that investment comes from uh, private family businesses, corporate Australian investment or offshore investment. We still have first and last mile issues in regard to, uh, to road access. And of course, 
um, even our universal service obligation to deliver phone services to rural Australians is based on landlines. Now, how, how outdated is that? You know, a lot of people don't have landlines anymore. It's time to review that, time to move on, look at mobile phone access, data services, etc., etc. So, uh, Infrastructure Australia has an infrastructure priority list uh, that we, uh, uh, we've developed. It has many, many projects and initiatives on it. Uh, just to clarify, projects uh, relate to projects that are in fact ready to go, have been through our process, and, and if they're on that list, we are recommending them to the proponent to go ahead with, uh, with our tick. Initiatives are still, uh, have received the first stage tick, but are still being developed by, uh, by the proponents. And I'm not going to go through them in, in detail, um, but in this, uh, in this particular list, we've pulled out uh, the ones that sp specifically relate to, uh, to agriculture. The inland rail, uh, as you can see, is, uh, is on there. And that, of course, is uh, uh, programmed to be funded by the, uh, by the Commonwealth Government. All the other, the other project and all the other initiatives on there, and I'm not going to refer to them in detail, are, uh, in fact, joint, joint proposals by uh, the Commonwealth and the particular state jurisdiction. Uh, and most of the projects that we assess, bearing in mind that we only look at projects over $100 million in value, uh, most of them are in fact joint initiatives where there will be a, a, a mixture of Commonwealth and, uh, and state funding. <coughs> so, in closing, uh, what do I see as the challenges for policy development that does encourage efficient and, and sustainable investment in, uh, in agriculture? First of all, taking a long-term view, prioritising the need and, uh, and prioritising economic opportunity over short-term political opportunism um, is, is, I think, absolutely imperative. Easy for me to stand here and say that. For governments, that's extremely difficult when they've been elected for either a three- or four-year term. But if we are going to have efficient, well-competitive infrastructure, we have to take a long-term view to, uh, to getting that infrastructure in place. We have to maintain our commitment to research and development and, uh, and technology and invest accordingly. We have to develop further supply chain opportunities. Um, and, that, and that, of course, is a very, very broad subject. Um, governments can't do it by themselves. Obviously, uh, obviously um, business has to be involved in, uh, in that as well. But, but the real basics, airports, roads, rail, um, etc., there is no doubt that the government has a very important role to play. Despite a lot of efforts, we still have too much restrictive red and green tape in this country compared to, uh, to our, our competitors from, uh, from other nations. It's too slow to get approvals. There's too much cost involved in, uh, in getting approvals. So, again, we have to maintain the effort, increase the effort in regard to uh, streamlining that. And all governments, I think, have a role to play there. Security of tenure, of course, is very important, um, particularly when you're investing in a, a new area or a, or in, or a foreign country. And, and of course, minimising sovereign risk uh, is, is a part of that. Uh, until recent years, probably Australia was seen as, a, uh, as an investment opportunity that had very, very minimal sovereign risk. A few things in, in recent years have probably challenged that a little bit, but, but it's something that that um, uh, I think governments and politicians need to be very, very conscious of uh, when, uh, when they're developing policy uh, and, uh, and making public statements. And the final thing I'll say is that, that no doubt climate volatility is, uh, is certainly with us, here to stay, and, uh, and no doubt is going to affect uh, what infrastructure we build, how we build it, uh, and what form that, the, that takes going, uh, going into the future. And Frank, in the interest of time, I'll leave it at that. Thank you.